these uh, blue water sections of the dives are the opportunity we have to engage with you a little bit more when we're, the operations are a bit lighter. I, uh, I just had a couple of great questions that I, I wanted to pass to the ROV team, if, if that's okay, while we're descending. Absolutely. And um, one of those was, uh, how are the ROVs positioned relative to each other during the descent? Uh, so we actually uh, are stern to stern, if you like. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, we travel down to the same depth together. So we're stretched out behind the ship in a line, so to speak, and uh, the back of Herc is connected to the back of Argus. So we actually face those two ends together to keep the tether stretched out. And then we can see, uh, we keep an eye on the tether uh, between the vehicles with the cameras that are both of the aft of each vehicle. Okay. And um, then we can see, there's basically, the, depending on the weather and the speed of the winch, um, will kind of dictate how the vehicles are behaving. We try and keep them stable. And so we, if we see that tether kind of whipping back and forth, we'll adjust our speed and how hard I'm tugging on it. Um, and that'll, uh, keep everything in control and in a happy place on the way down. It's that guy. And then uh, the other question we had was uh, an another great one. It was about the, the, the buoyancy of the ROVs. So I know that out of the water, Hercules is almost about 4,000 pounds. Is that right? Uh, closer to six, actually. Okay. Yeah. And uh, But then what's its, uh, what's its uh, uh, effective weight in the water? Uh, it depends on dive to dive, but we aim to be positively buoyant uh, by about 40 to 50 pounds. Right. Yeah. <coughs> and then, of course, Argus is negatively buoyant by in water by about 3,000 pounds. Okay. And so Argus' main role is to hold the cable down, so to keep uh, the cable under control. Um, it Essentially, all that weight will always, Argus always wants to swing back towards the stern of the ship. Yeah, like a giant pendulum. Yeah, and then um, we arrange ourselves in a certain way that Argus goes up and down with the ship, but then it decouples that wave motion from Hercules, and so Herc doesn't feel any of that motion. Uh -huh. And that's how he can park on the seafloor and sit there for long extended periods of time and not get tugged on by the motion of the ship. That's cool, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. One type of question we get on Nautilus Live that I uh, I always like to answer is, how can you join the Nautilus? So um, just we had one, uh, one contributor who uh, introduced themselves as an aspiring teacher for elementary grades, graduating fall 2020, and how they can get involved in the program. Uh, a great way to become involved with the Nautilus is as a science communication fellow. The way to find out um, about that is to go to the website oet.org that's the Ocean Exploration Trust's website the organization that operates the Nautilus so go to oet.org and click on education and you will see uh, a single page that lists all of the various opportunities to uh, join uh, the Nautilus the Science Communication <laughs> Fellowship is uh, aimed towards educators both formal and informal and they typically accept um, applications around December January each year and Essentially, what they're looking for are, are, are passionate educators with a connection to uh, uh, the oceans, even sometimes very tenuous connections. I'm, a, I'm an astronomer who's interested in looking for life beyond Earth, and so that was my kind of route into um, working with the Nautilus. So uh, don't be afraid. Always put yourself forward. And so that's a great page where you can find out about those opportunities. There's also listed there the various internships we offer to um, uh, students and people in their kind of uh, educational career. Those internships cover ROV engineering, video engineering, ocean science, and navigation. And uh, I guess we have one intern sitting with us at the moment. Alex, uh, I don't know if you have a moment. Do you want to talk a little bit about how, yeah. how you came to join the Nautilus? Yeah, so... I go to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, uh, I study ocean engineering there. And in our, at, at, at that school, our summers, uh, we are offered different opportunities to um, apply for different programs uh, and pursue different summer trainings. Um, so within my major and the oceanography department, 
we, there was a, a list of internships that we were eligible to apply for. Um, so I do a few, uh, Nautilus, Nautilus being one of them. Um, and within the ocean engineers and the oceanographers, uh, I interviewed and got this position and then was reached out by OET and the, uh, the Nautilus team. And here I am. Cool. Uh, sitting navigator. No, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep an eye on them. Yeah. <laughs> There's also the um, ship to shore interactions people could sign up to do, right? For teachers? Yeah, that tends to be, um, that's not something we offer generally to the public just because we don't have the resources to support, you know. A lot of people. Yeah, so what we tend to do is the, that's one of the roles that the science communication fellows um, perform is they kind of serve as a, a widening of the educational network that we serve almost like as ambassadors, really. If once they get back on shore after the, their Nautilus experience, they kind of keep up a pretty close relationship with us. And uh, they tend to be one of our biggest sources of the, the, the live one-on-one -on -one broadcast we do. Cool. But yeah, it's, it's really a resource issue. If um, we opened it up <laughs> in general, it would be wildly popular. And it would be wonderful, but we just wouldn't have the resources to, to yeah. serve that. Yeah. yeah. So one question I was uh, interested to ask uh, Megan. If, uh, are you there, Megan, on the back row? Yep, I'm here. So yesterday was the first dive when we actually brought um, samples back to the uh, surface for some of the, the scientists who were accompanying us from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And uh, I was just going to ask you, what was the atmosphere like last night once we uh, got the ROVs back on deck? There were some pretty uh, excited-looking scientists clutching sample bottles and ready to go at uh, eight, 8 o'clock in the evening. Megan, just so you know, Cam Sai is on back row. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the, the atmosphere was, was very excited, as usual. Um, it's kind of like all of the work that we've done on the seafloor and exploring um, the fruits of all that work just arrives on deck and all, all scientists I think on most cruises are pretty excited to see what what Herc brings up uh-huh so things went things went pretty well I think everybody um, uh, had pretty successful sampling efforts in our two our two labs and um, there didn't seem to be anything uh, too disappointing across the whole science team. So I'd say it was a pretty great success. No, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I, I just had somebody on Nautilus uh, live tell me, um, were you once an intern as well? Uh, yes, I was. There's, there's, a, there's a worryingly long memory on nautiluslive.org. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so I was an intern in 2015. Um, okay. The same year as Jess, actually. Right. I think actually the same cruise. Um, Galapagos. Yeah. Galapagos, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the same cruise. Yeah. So that was that was great. And I think actually maybe that was the last time I sat watch with Nicole. Was that? As uh, I recall, it is, yeah. And it was yeah. mostly mapping. It was No, no, but we also sat watch for the Galapagos, Galapagos when we got the giant Riftia. platform, yeah, Galapagos mm -hmm. platform. There's a great picture of oh like four of us holding this <laughs> giant <laughs> Riftia. It's like 13 feet long. But it was.
entirely decomposed inside, and poor Megan's holding the tube is like <laughs> it's I was, I was too. given oh. orders yeah. to yeah, how to process this 13. Uh, sorry, I sampled that one tube. for you guys. That was not a great yeah. sample. Yeah, <laughs> it, was was a, it was a poor choice <laughs> out of the whole bunch. We got that one. I was like, all right, I get it. I'm the that's intern. That's the one, <laughs> all that's the one okay. everybody pointed at. So that's the one they got. <laughs> Gosh, that smelled bad. <laughs> no, it was. Cool. Well, that was kind of funny because the scientists were talking about like. You know, you notice the the smells of samples in the lab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yesterday was also supposedly um, a pretty stinky sample load. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so you've been out here four times or four five, years. Five years. Five years. Yep. Five years. <laughs> Josh is like. Has it been that long? Time <laughs> 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 flies, you know, you're having fun. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people on, on Nautilus have cycled through the internship program. It's a pretty unique uh, part of OET and, and the Nautilus to provide that kind of opportunities. It's really special. Yeah. No, that was great. Thanks, Megan. We could speed up just a touch, I think. Roger. What depth are we at at the moment, guys? We are at 890 meters. That's uh, for about 70 minutes. Yeah. To the seafloor. Oh, that's pretty good. That's just over a kilometer an hour. Speeding. Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to target about 25 meters per minute right now. Right. So for those of you just uh, perhaps joining us on nautiluslive.org, we are currently descending through the water column to our dive site at uh, 2,700 meters. Today we'll, we'll be visiting the Seacliff Hydrothermal Vent Site again. We've been visiting there the last two days, continuing our scientific experiments on site. We heard from Nicole earlier that we will be visiting some of the high temperature vents today. We had a chance to fly by some of those yesterday, and uh, they really look like some quite incredible sights, so it's going to be uh, a great day on site down there. These uh, um, vent sites are not at the, uh, the typical place where we've encountered such vents before, such as really at the, the center, at the spreading center of uh, two tectonic plates, in this case the Pacific and the Gorda plates. But if you imagine kind of a submarine rift valley with the uh, spreading center being running in a kind of a ridge down the center, we're operating off to the side of that rift valley on the, the, um, the steep cliffs uh, on the sides. It's a very interesting hydrothermal vent field, quite uh, unique in many respects. The whole site is um, about 180 kilometers off the west coast of North America, so that's where the Nautilus is operating right now. Pretty much just where, if you imagine on a world map where Oregon borders California and then take a line heading out westwards from there for 180 kilometers. That's pretty much where we are. We were a little bit delayed getting into the water today because of high wind speeds, but uh, they abated and uh, we're currently diving. And uh, just a quick word from our ROV, ROV pilot, just uh, give us the heads up that maybe another 70 minutes, so perhaps around uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time this morning, we should uh, contact the seafloor and then orientate ourselves for our day's dive operations. So feel free to keep your questions and comments coming on nautiluslive.org. We uh, 
these blue water descents and ascents are a great opportunity for us to engage with you guys. Once we actually get to the seafloor, we become a bit more focused on operations and uh, we offer you just more kind of updates as you listen to our operational chatter. I know you find all aspects of it interesting, but uh, yeah, keep the, the comments and questions going. Oh, I just got a, a great one on uh, nautiluslive.org. The uh, Friday Harbour Robotics class starts in 15 minutes, so I think there's going to be uh, quite a few questions coming in then. For those of you who don't know, this is I'm guessing this is uh, Friday Harbour in uh, um, San Juan, or Orcas Island. I forget it. It's, uh, it's part of the San Juan group. They're going to tell me in about three minutes' time. Help me get my geography right, guys. If all goes well, we'll probably stay in the water today till about um, five o'clock in the afternoon uh, Pacific time. We, uh, we try to operate as far as possible on this particular cruise, a fairly regular daily dive schedule. Thank you, Sam Garson, on San Juan Island for correcting my geography. Yep, it's... Uh, they will burn the ship down if we call them Orcas Island. Also, I'd like to say hello to Ms. Fletcher's biology class at Highland Tech. You guys are, are watching us now. I hope you've got time to continue through the day with us. Just a nice little creature in Hercules camera there. Oh no, sorry, Argus. Another great question on Nautilus Live was, um, what differences are there between this hydrothermal vent field and others? So... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest difference is that this one's fairly unique in... Um, the white smokers instead of black smokers. And that's uh, the minerals that are being deposited, the minerals that are coming out in the superheated fluids are different. Um, all of the transition metals that are present in the black smoker vents are being deposited, they think, subsurface at these vents. And so the fluids are fairly clear and a lot of the minerals are clay minerals. Um, the chimneys are very fragile, friable. Um, and don't get much over a meter tall would be a tall one. Whereas those black smoker chimneys can look like skyscrapers. They're pretty incredible. Yeah, about 40, well, 40 meters are some of the ones that uh, I've seen at Endeavor before. Yeah, and th so those are much, um, obviously they're stronger chimneys. Yes. So today uh, we were actually given instruction that if we need to um, sort of remove some of the chimney material to get at the opening for good samples and that's what we're gonna do uh-huh um, but you know these are ephemeral vent chimneys so they'll continue to be precipitated afterwards after we leave yeah oh yes the the, the growth rate certainly at the black smoker sites are incredible you know several centimeters per day at least yeah was anyone on the pescadero site uh, I wasn't on that cruise, but I recall that we stuck a temperature probe or something in. Um, there's actually something we may have even left temporarily, and then we got, came back and there was growth over it a couple of days later. Yeah, we were actually talking about that um, a couple of nights ago. I think that was Greg and Miles were on that cruise, and you're right. They knocked the vent over to um, sample at the base and then came back uh, either the next day or you know a couple of days later. 
and looked at it and said, didn't we knock this vent over? It had basically regrown in a couple of days. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Very dynamic environment, which is different when you think of a lot of the deep sea. Uh, it, these environments have a lot of activity, both just geologically with the fluids coming out and the growth of chimneys and formation of crusts and then uh, a lot of specialized communities. I think that's another thing that I was reading about in the literature about the site we're visiting today at Seacliff is it, you know, being, it's referred to as being an off-axis hydrothermal vent site, so kind of away from the main spreading center where you typically expect the intense activity to be. And uh, that's quite a unique feature of it. Yeah, we don't see, um, there are some differences in the community types that we see at this hydrothermal system versus others. Um, many of the others will have the clams uh, and the Riftia tube worms here, we're seeing smaller Rigia tube worms. Uh, we're seeing the blue silate mats. And there are lots of little um, polychaete worms, polynoids at this site. Uh, a lot of the smaller fauna, but, but no clams, That's which makes it different than a lot of the others. Uh huh. So uh, a great question from one of our younger viewers on NautilusLive.org, uh, wanting to know um, how the ROVs, so these are remotely operated vehicles, that's what that acronym stands for. So there's, uh, there's actually no humans inside them. We control it down essentially a, a big remote control cable that goes down into the ocean following them. But how are those o ROVs able to withstand the high pressure at such depths? I know that's something that uh, forms a daily challenge for ROV operations. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, our number one goal to keep water out of electronics, <laughs> <laughs> especially seawater. Um, we do it actually in a couple basic ways. Uh, one is we have electronics inside housings. Um, of different materials and they're designed to withstand the actual ocean pressures up to a certain point. Um, so on Hercules, for example, we have a main electronics bottle, um, which is essentially a long cylindrical housing that contains uh, the bulk of the electronics and sort of the brain, if you will, of Hercules and uh, it's all in air. And so that, that bottle is able to withstand 4,000 meters of ocean pressure. Um, Argus actually is are made out of stainless steel uh, and those can withstand 6,000 meters so it's basically just the thickness of the different of the, uh, the material that you use will kind of dictate its rating. Um, and then another way is to use uh, oil filled boxes or bottles if you will. Uh, so we have a, several different oil-filled boxes on Hercules. And so we are, those are junction boxes. So essentially you have all of your electronics in the, uh, coming out of its main bottle into a junction box. And then we can connect instruments and lights and other things at that location rather than opening the, uh, the one that we call a one atmosphere bottle. So the air-filled bottle is one atmosphere always. The oil fill boxes actually see the ocean pressure and we fill those with oil uh, and then put a little bit of pressure inside that. Uh, usually, you know, anywhere between three and eight PSI. So the pressure inside those oil fill junction boxes are whatever pressure the ocean is pushing on them plus the little bit of pressure that we put on it. Um, and we do that uh, for a couple different reasons. Um, it, it, uh, we don't want to have air inside there because as we go down in those type of boxes, the air will compress. Um, and so we try and get all the air out of that. And then we put on, a, we have an extra volume of oil outside of that box with a spring and that, that's what creates the pressure. And then if we have a problem or we have a leak, we have a gauge on that that we keep an eye on all the time. And um, 
we can tell if we have an issue with a leak or uh, a, um, something happening within that box where we need to recover the vehicles. And it's easier for us to open, and it's safer to open. So we can drain the oil out, take the lid off, uh, do any wiring in there uh, that we need to to connect instruments or, or whatever changes that we're making to the vehicle, seal that back up, fill it full of oil, and uh, it's a quicker way and a safer way to access the electronics rather than opening the, the one atmosphere bottles. Um, the foam on Hercules, for example, is a limiting factor. Uh, so it's 4,000 meter rated foam. And that's the foam pack. That's the part that where we have, we were talking earlier about having a 6,000 pound vehicle on air suddenly becoming positively buoyant as soon as you put it on the water. And that's because of that big yellow uh, foam block. It looks, it's hard, like it's very, very hard. It's not soft foam. This is high density foam. Uh, and so the that can only take so much pressure. Uh, they're tiny little glass spheres that are poured into a mold and then covered uh, with a yellow kind of, that yellow color is a specific uh, kind of a gel coating around the foam and helps protect it. And so that can only take so much pressure. Um, so everything we put on the vehicle is rated, uh, rated for a depth. And so uh, for Hercules, the two limiting factors are its foam block and its 4,000 meter rated electronics bottle. That's cool. Thanks, Josh. Uh, you're welcome. I hope uh, I hope the Friday Harbor Robotics class was uh, was in session for that one. That was a that was a good description. Thank you. So uh, another great question on Nautilus Live was um, what's actually coming out of these vents and uh, that uh, Nicole and I were describing a little bit earlier. It's, uh, it's superheated water. And what I mean by superheated is, well, we saw yesterday there were vents where water's coming out at maybe between 15 and 50 degrees Celsius. But hopefully today we're going to be measuring vent fluid. And what we mean by that is hot water coming out at temperatures uh, possibly well in excess of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, I think over the last couple of days we've measured up to about 200 degrees Celsius. And um, that stay, we call it superheated water because although you would expect it to become steam at that point, the immense pressure of the overlying ocean at uh, these depths, about 270 atmospheres of pressure, where we have one atmosphere of pressure at the surface, that prevents that hot water from becoming steam. And so we call it superheated at that stage. Oh, looks like we just got a big red in the uh, Argus field of view, just nicely there. That's uh, uh, big red is actually pretty much the common name for it. It's a large red jellyfish. And one of the experiments that we try to perform each day with these um, hydrothermal vent systems is actually to capture some of that vent material. You'll see um, perhaps later in the dive, we'll take a look around the front porch of Hercules. I think we've got a couple of what are called IGT samplers in the uh, front porch. Those are isobaric gas tight samplers. And uh, they're a really neat device because they're designed to sample the vent fluid, the water coming out, yet keep it at the same pressure that it was sampled as we take it all the way back to the surface. And why that's important is because that superheated water also contains a variety of different gases uh, dissolved in the water. And if we were to uh, release the pressure on them as they um, came back to the surface, those gases would come out of solution and uh, it would be much more difficult to sample them. They'd leak away. And so by keeping them under pressure all the way to the laboratory, we can essentially sample that water under pressure and actually work out what the gas composition is. And really the clue you're looking for there is the, the, the load of dissolved gases and dissolved minerals in that vent fluid gives you an idea of what kind of um, hot rock the water is passing over and reacting with in regions of the Earth's crust that we're never going to get down to with the ROV, so well below the surface, sometimes even hundreds of meters below the surface, these, re these reactions are happening. 
And so the, the chemistry of that vent fluid gives us uh, some clue as to what might be happening down there. So for those of you watching on Nautilus Live, just uh, wondering about some of the sea creatures uh, we see. Um, well, there we go. That's one of the sea creatures we see on the Argus view there. There's another big red jellyfish. I forget. I remember I've, I've got a, a photo journal of deep sea creatures that I've, I've got at home, one of these big thick coffee table books. Do any of you guys remember it's got a wonderful Latin name, Big Red. It's something like Tiburon Rojo or something like that. I'm not sure. Can you explain why it wouldn't, <laughs> Can you explain why it wouldn't look red right now? Well, that's the kind of question I'd leave to a video engineer to mm. give a Isn't proper I, explanation. <laughs> yeah. I can do no, no, I can do that. I just, you know. The science communicator would be a good thing. Well, so we're underwater, what, water, which you means tell that me, we and I'll communicate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, John, here you go. We're underwater, so the sunlight is filtered out, and we are at a thousand four hundred meters below the surface. So it's pretty dark, and that means that as we get deeper, the red light wavelengths have been filtered out, and everything is just kind of blue. But what happens when we throw the white light of the RV onto the subject? Well, we should be able to see it yeah. as it is. So why wasn't it red? Well, was it even in the light? Uh, a little bit. I didn't think it was in the light. <laughs> but you saw it. <laughs> but we don't have much light on it at the moment. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Or it's it's that the that the light or the the red light um, isn't that it dissipates quickly in the water. Yeah. Whereas other other wavelengths are um, don't get filtered out as quickly. And that's also why we have green lasers is because they that's right. are visible they're better they're underwater. Quote unquote brighter, but they're just easier to see. Yeah. <laughs> than red. What's that guy on Herc? Oh, another kind of jelly. Rocket ship jelly. <laughs> 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 Should be. You, you heard it first from the, the date logger. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you... We're just chatting back here. Yeah. No, no, we've got, a, we've got a new common name for that creature. Thank you. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, it's uh, Big Red is uh, Tiburonia Gran Rojo. So literally, Big Red. <laughs> what I'm fascinated by is that it wasn't discovered or described until 2003. That's really? right. It was on wow. it was on these vertical water column transects that people started seeing them, and then eventually they sampled one. And it was first at Davidson Seamount, I believe. Yeah. Really. For so they're pretty common. I mean, you see them on a lot of descents. Yeah. Ascents. So common, people didn't bother studying it. Maybe. <laughs> it's like there's I another mean, it's thing. Like taxonomy is, they always say it's a it's a dying field because it's just not well funded and it takes a long time to describe a new species so there are a lot of things that have been discovered by us nautilus but it just takes years to get the data published yeah. actually i think the most prolific are the sponge uh, taxonomists they've been identifying new sponge at a pretty quick rate would, would the gen like the genomics revolution does that increase the pace at which new species are described? I'm not an expert on this, but I think um, t 
to some degree it helps, but it's also a challenge because you have to then know what the genomic <coughs> signature of all the others are, right? So you have That's to have true. something to compare it to, which is why we try to do DNA of every sample that we take, mm -hmm. uh, or we preserve uh, a section of it for DNA. So I can continue that story for you. Somebody's actually just uh, given me some more tidbits of information on nautiluslive.org. Uh, so uh, the, the, the Latin name, Tiburonia Gran Rojo, um, it actually comes from Embari, the, uh, the Monterey Bay Area Research Institute's ROV, Tiburon. I'm guessing they were the first people to discover it. So it's basically, the Latin is just the name of the ROV that um, either first sampled it or first took an image of it, and then Big Red, Isn't there a worm that was that's called Alvanella or something like this? Yeah, named after Alvin. Many creatures like that, and uh, I guess the site we're visiting today, Seacliff, is uh, named after um, an ROV. It's you know most of us are you know we know we're exploring a, a Seacliff site, but it's actually named after the ROV that was the first one to go there. Do we know, for example, for the the new species that we collected? last summer on the Nautilus, how long it might be for them to be documented? Kind of depends on the researcher. Um, so a lot of them are in the hands of researchers right now. But like, for example, uh, they think that Valatunid, the purple orb, was a new species, but that's been several years. So, you know, maybe those researchers are just a little more backed up on, on doing the publications that in the, the writing uh, to get it out there. But then other researchers, like I mentioned, uh, Dr. Henry Ricewig is the sponge expert that's ID'd many of our samples uh, from the sanctuaries and found new sponges. And those have been published in literature um, pretty quickly afterwards, like within a couple years. I remember you saying, Nicole, about the resources and um, certainly around the National Marine Sanctuaries the knowledge of sponges and coral, corals. That's, um, that's basically part of what the research is funded to do, is that right? Yeah, that's true. The sanctuaries uh, are mostly pretty small groups of, of folks uh, working in you know localized regions. For example, the Monterey Bay scientists, there's usually only one research coordinator at each sanctuary, and um, they'll go out uh, and study a lot of coastal things, and, and then they use groups like us to try to get into the deeper waters that they just don't have access to, uh, at least not with ROVs. Um, so it's been a great partnership to work with them. Now, um, one um, piece of information I'm, I'm not sure on is, uh, I think, are we going back this year to the Davidson Seamount? And I was just wondering which uh, sanctuary that's part of. Yes, we are. So Davidson Seamount is part of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and that's the same. Uh, so the area where we found the octopus's garden is on the flanks of the seamount, um, an area that Nautilus had mapped a couple of years ago, and there are um, sort of basaltic blocks on the seafloor that uh, we're now seeing have these fractures between them and um, the octopus were brooding over. So we'll probably visit, well, we know we'll visit that site, but we'll also likely do some work on Davidson Seamount as well. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty well um, studied seamount in terms of um, in terms of seamounts around the world. I mean, it's, you know, pretty close to the land, so it's not too difficult to get to. Yeah. Um, I think the barrier to studying it, of course, is the great depth that it's at. Yeah. It's about 3,000 meters, is that right? That's right. Yeah. And that has some of the most spectacular growths of coral and sponge that I've ever seen, so pretty neat. I know that earlier this year, it was the subject of a Blue Planet Live um, documentary, where basically uh, research ships with ROVs were down there, but broadcasting uh, live to, I think it's the BBC and French television. That's right, they took uh, Dwight Coleman and uh, Chad King, who is Chad's the research coordinator for Monterey Bay, out on the Atlantis, and Atlantis was out in that area doing shakedown trials like most ships do at the start of their seasons. And um, they had Alvin on board as well, so they did a couple of dives uh, to the octopus's garden on Alvin. And I know uh, Chad was super excited to get the opportunity to do that. 
Yeah, it was, it was unfortunate. It was just kind of a European broadcast. North Americans missed out on that one. That's right, yeah. Even I, I thought maybe they'd pass the uh, video through the Inner Space Center, but they didn't. So oh, and we, we heard the reports from scientists, but that's about it. Right. Well, I guess we're actually... Uh, no, you can, you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, we it's actually may have the opportunity to see a mini octopus's garden today. We have a, a small octopus garden that looks very much like the Davidson Seamount at the Hydroth Seacliff Hydrothermal Vent site. Yeah, we might pass over on our way. Um. It's not as extensive as at Davidson, but it's still... It's still pretty neat to see it at this, you know, it's a pretty varied site we've got here. It is, yeah. I was excited to see the uh, geotransect yesterday because it was, uh, again, very different. We went up over that steep wall. I saw it, it was just you know, fields and fields of uh, pillow lava. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just going to ping a, a quick question to uh, to Alex there. I was just wondering, on your charts, Alex, do you actually have a wind speed measurement? It feels like it's uh, settled down a little bit out there. I do have a wind speed measurement. Uh, right now it's about 25 knots. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's been creeping up a little bit, actually, since the launch. It's deceptive. It's, uh, it's felt pretty smooth in here the first uh, hour or so of the watch. I think the waves are down a little bit, and that's, I think, what's uh, keeping us in the water right now. So the wind's up, but the waves are a wee bit down. There's not a whole lot of current, so the ship's maintaining pretty good. So just for those of you on nautiluslive.org following us and uh, if you're perhaps wondering what our status is at the moment what we're doing the ROVs are in the water and they are descending through the water column to our dive site today which is the Seacliff hydrothermal vent site about 2.7 kilometers under the ocean we've got a full day of operation on the seafloor ahead of us till about 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time the uh, the site we're visiting is um, part of a um, a gigantic kind of submarine rift valley called the, the Gorda Ridge. It's uh, formed where the Pacific and the Gorda Plates are spreading apart from each other. And if you imagine this uh, gigantic rift valley that runs for a couple of hundred kilometers along the seafloor, um, we're working sort of along the flanks of that valley on some of the steep terrain off to one side at a pretty unique hydrothermal vent site. The whole site, Gorda Ridge, and where we are in the Nautilus right now, that's about 180 kilometers off the west coast of North America. And uh, this will be our third consecutive uh, dive day. It's been uh, pretty exciting so far to see the scientists work through the experiments on site. We've got, a, as I said, another full day planned. Yeah, we hope to have 10 dives here, so another week of dives. Hopefully, right here at this site. Where are people tuning in from now? Oh, crikey. <laughs> let me uh, let me calm my mind and reach out to the internet. Okay. 
Oh, we've got, we've got pretty good coverage, actually. We've, uh, of course, because it's uh, daytime across North America, we've got a lot of folks across North America joining us. Um, it's evening in Europe, and uh, we've got a lot of, uh, lot of people in Europe joining us. I'm just looking out across the globe. We've got a few folks out there in Australia, and uh, I can see, I think, one person in Japan. Yep, we've got someone in Japan watching us. Shout out to the Isle of Man as well. We've got someone on the Isle of Man watching us. <laughs> and uh, just a, a couple of people in the Caribbean and down in Colombia. So we are global right now. Hello. I know we have a very dedicated viewer in New Zealand as well. They're obviously taking some valuable downtime at the moment. <laughs> But yeah, it's wonderful how we form this kind of extended global community. And of course, now I've mentioned that at your prompting, I now have shout outs from all around the world. Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Actually, I see, uh, yep, yep, I now have hundreds of posts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay, we're, what, 40 minutes from the bottom about? Yep. <laughs> so now, now is the time to go uh, <laughs> get your cup of tea or coffee or It's like the snacks. commercial at the go, Super Bowl. Yeah, this is the commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get exciting or half more exciting soon. Halftime break is more watched than the actual Super Bowl itself. No, 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 you no know, not halftime. Do not do not diss the deep water, <laughs> the, the blue water dives. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. <laughs> Okay, so where have we got here? So actually, a member of the uh, Nautilus team looks like uh, Alex Havens is saying hi from Alaska. I've got Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, Istanbul, oh. Burbank, California. Of that Suna. <laughs> it's Suna, hello. <laughs> she Suna. just sent me an email recently. <laughs> oh, there you go. Told her we're all excited to have her out again soon. Bingo. Hello, Armenia. We are receiving you. And we've got Gainesville, Florida, Georgia. Yeah. See what you've done? <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just thought it would be interesting. <laughs> See what your interest has gotten us into. <laughs> Stay curious, people. <laughs> And I wasn't reading my map carefully enough. Uh, just a, a hi to Moyer in New Zealand. They are watching. <laughs> it's 4.23 a.m. and they're, um, they're, they're live with us. Dedication. Yep. Lots of dedication. Yep. You didn't break the internet. You broke the stream. <laughs> <laughs> Look how special that global community is of people all watching at the same time, all over the world. It's called the magic of telepresence. It is. <laughs> it's magical. And now they all get to have this moment together. Yep. All saying hi at once. So we've actually, uh, as I hope, we've still got Friday Harbor Robotics class with us. And um, I was just going to ask you guys, because um, we're on a blue water at the moment, um, and, uh, and you as well, Sarah, whether we, we might be able to um, give uh, those guys uh, a bit of a tour of the ROV on the, on the video feed, maybe using Channel 3 on the Quad V or something. 
we might be able to uh, show them some of the cameras that actually um, take us on a tour around the ROV. We Th could do that. Does that sound okay? Yeah. So uh, I'll How about just follow ROV's lead. Is that okay with you guys, ROV? Yeah, for sure. We get some lights on the scene here. Yeah, so I guess that's Sam Garson's uh, robotics class. We're going to start with Herc Zeus, which is the main Herc camera. Oh, yeah. nice. Hi. <laughs> so I guess there's the front porch and our, our toolbox for today. Yeah. Yeah, we have uh, the, the two IGTs that's in the black basket there, the big giant things with number seven and eight. Uh, we have just below that those little white uh, lids, those are markers we're going to put on the C4. Physically mark some of the areas we've been working. We have a crowbar, just as a multi use tool for prying and poking things. Um, and then we have a couple of wands to the right. So those are, one of those is to um, measure temperature and take in fluid for the super sampler. And the other one's like an X current one. That's the one on the far right. Uh, and then the arm that operates and picks up and collects the samples and does the wanding is this craft predator here. So that's our seven function, more dexterous arm that we use quite often. And then we have another uh, six function arm, it's an IC Magnum, uh, that's more of a, a strong arm that we, is not quite as dexterous, but is used for uh, holding instruments, taking things on the seafloor. Um, we use that on these dives to sort of just as a safety for the IGTs. Um, they're heavy, so they should stay in the basket, but we kind of hover the arm over it as just in case they hop out. Sometimes it'd be pretty rough on a launch. So just in case they move, we use that as a, a way to make sure they stay in the basket. And then up above, On that corner, you can see, so out by the light on the, the furthest sort of field of view there, that's the mapper. And then just in front of that is the CTD. And then those are our lights up there. So that's where we're getting all our light from. That and middle bubble is Herc Bubble Cam. Yeah, Bubble Cam in the center. And then above that, you can see the black kind of uh, uh, round objects with a little bar in between. Those are actually sample jars. We don't have that. We it's a rotating carousel of sample jars, but we don't have enough room to put our little suction hose. But we, if you ever see us kind of vacuuming up samples on the seafloor, that's where the samples end up going in those jars. We can rotate that and put uh, seven independent samples in those jars. If you look on the SatFeed 3, you can see the view from bubble camera right now. It looks down onto the, the porch and they can turn it to look at the different gauges and uh, things up there yeah well, that's that's the tour cool thank you and on the side we have a uh, side we have uh, the port we have our miskin bottles over there? Right, on the port side of Herc, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, is that the, you can just see the lights of Argus off in the distance there behind it. So is that uh, in uh, quad view bottom left, is that the, the port side camera? That is, yeah. yeah, those are the Niskin bottles and you can actually see the, uh, on that feed one where they pull the tabs on the porch those wires hanging off yeah the rip are cords. labeled yeah and they trigger the caps to close on the niskin bottles yeah. when they pull those and starboard cam it's not much right now but as a drawer right uh, that's just you're catching the edge of the super sampler. Yeah. yeah. So normally that would view our 
uh, starboard bio box that we would put samples into. But we've pulled that off and exchanged it for the super sampler. I did see yesterday, we were actually, I wasn't on watch, but um, they were actually, that camera was showing the super sampler actually cycling just as a, as a test that it was working okay. Uh, yeah, so we put that on bubble cam. Okay. Yeah, and so we look back and there's a little flow meter that they watch to make sure that their commands are given or moving water. Right. Um, Jessica's uh, going to show you that bubble cam's up. Uh, yep. Bubble cam's now on sat feed three. So, yeah, we look at this little that was it. Yeah. paddle wheel. Yeah, exactly. That's what I saw going. Affectionately known as the whirly gig. <laughs> <laughs> So it rolls around and tells the scientists whether we're actually, uh, what kind of flow rates and stuff that we're getting. Right. So we'll usually, we'll keep that up on bubble cam uh, and be broadcasting that one because that's the one the scientists the shore want to see. Yep. Um, when we're sampling with the super sampler. In total, there are um, seven cameras on Herc and five on Argus. Um, and then there are uh, 15 on the boat itself. And uh, they're used for viewing, viewing the winches and viewing all the different views from Herc and Argus for the ROV engineers so that they can see where they are situationally and um, make sure that everything is <laughs> present and accounted for and it's just good to have eyes on all parts. Yeah. I just wanted to let you guys know that um, we've got a, quite a few schools who are actually watching this and they're, they're loving this opportunity to kind of uh, talk around some of the equipment and the science a little bit. We've also got a high school chemistry class in uh, LA watching right now. And uh, they, had, they had a great question actually was, uh, and this is something I've been discussing on, I've done a few Blue Water uh, watches recently with uh, some of the different ROV teams. And they were curious, what's kind of the balance between equipment that you can buy, let's say off the shelf, and the equipment that you guys have to kind of make in the shop? Because um, uh, you've got a whole ROV shop here. Um, for example, I was talking with Gabby last night and she was talking on other ships she's uh, been on. They actually have a 3D printer on board and will make some uh, bespoke brackets, this kind of thing. And I was just wondering, sort of day-to-day -day operations, kind of what's your, your guys' balance between off-the-shelf components and things you have to engineer that yourselves? Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, well, more and more these days you can get stuff well, sort of off-the-shelf or you can order uh, specific parts um, for the RVs. Uh, especially electronics-wise, you can get more and more of that kind of stuff rather than making things yourself. Um, but we do do a fair amount of custom work as well. We can, uh, we'll draw up uh, our own models for certain components um, that we want to put on the ROVs and have those made or fabricated. Um, so usually what we do prior to a cruise, leading up to a cruise, uh, scientists will let us know what uh, items they want to have on the ROV and if we kind of figure out if we have um, the things available to integrate the science equipment. And uh, if we don't, then we can either um, uh, design and fabricate those pieces that we need uh, or figure out a way to, to integrate them on. So uh, we try not to do too much like on the fly, but if things kind of go unexpectedly, we can, the shop is pretty well equipped to, to fabricate things on the fly and make things work uh, if we need to do that as well. So there is, there definitely is a, a balance there. Um, but like I said, more and more, especially electronics-wise, you can just keep, you can just kind of buy stuff, uh -huh. find it on the internet. There's different sources uh, that we use, uh, different suppliers that supply us the a lot of the pieces. Um, so yeah, this I'd say it's I would say probably leans to our more. We just we buy things that are available rather than than making them. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. do you do do your research? I walked in the other day and there was a site for glue of the month. Yes. <laughs> and uh, We're always it was all about yeah. the best glues to glue random things together and the best adhesive for the job. And who knew that the world of glue was so detailed? 
Well, well it's another science, right? That's a <laughs> different type of science that we do, right? We're engineers. Uh, Jess can tell us all about it. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's part of the other pieces of science that sometimes uh, the nautilus size doesn't realize that's going on. There's a lot of science in the RV shop going on. Uh, we're always researching. We're always trying different things. We're experimenting. We're trying to find the best things that work for us and then ultimately work for the ocean scientists who want to collect their samples on the seafloor. It's all funneled towards the same goal. So there's uh, there's science in every nook and cranny on the Nautilus. We're always, we're always experimenting.